Alvin Kamara is Hayden Winks's top running back for week nine against the Chicago Bears. Hayden, the opportunity and the production attached to it puts him in the mountaintop alone. It is w- absolutely crazy ride that they got here, but the Saints are also playing with wow. a lot of pace. They are top three in both projected points and plays this season right now. So it's just like a spot where you just have to accept it. You know, he's getting the ball on early situations. He's getting the ball at the goal line. He's catching passes in the dump and dump off areas. And Derek Carr just loves throwing him the ball. The Bears have been good against the run, but Chicago is also allowing a league high 15.9 receiving points. That's in full point PPR to opposing backfields. Uh, guess what? Alvin Kamara is still running the ball 17 or more times in each of his last four games. And also, I believe, leads the league in receptions since rejoining this team among all players. All players. Sure. Not just why, not? Backs. why not? Pretty insane. Um, and we should mention... That part of the reason that Alvin Kamara is on by, the likes of the Detroit Lions, the San Francisco 49ers, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and yes, the Jaleel McLaughlin-led Denver Broncos mm-hmm. are also on by weeks as well. We will cover the next, I don't know, 32 running backs today in these rankings. And just for you, our beloved audience, at some point during this video, we'll also give away five hats. So be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for that. Okay, let's continue on. Over into Tier 2, and that brings us to Saquon Barkley against the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, The Raiders have allowed 152.6 yards from scrimmage per game to opposing backfields, Hayden. Uh, That's 30th in the NFL. It's been really bad. Ramondre, Deonta Foreman, and then Jameer Gibbs on Monday Night Football have all posted at least 15 half PPR points. Saquon's coming off a 40-touch game. Things will not be that drastic this week because it does sound like Daniel Jones is going to be back. Potentially both offensive tackles are back in this game too, but it's not just that Jameer Gibbs ran all over this Raiders defense. They also were on the field for 81 plays on the road on Monday night football. Obviously they're, they're back at home in this situation, but I do think that this Raiders defense was getting really ran on. I do think that Saquon Barkley remains the focal point of this Giants offense. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an understatement. Over the last right. three games, 28, 24, and 39 touches. Yeah. For Saquon Barkley. So, yes, I, I would call him the focal point, too. And no Darren Waller on top and, of it. Yeah, imagine that, Josh. Imagine no Darren Waller in our lives. Okay, the next running back is Austin Eckler against the New York Jets. Uh, Hayden, we open the season with Kellen Moore running the crap out of the football. And really over the last few weeks, especially when Austin Eckler was absent, but even since he has returned, this team has not been able to successfully run the football again. They have not, and the Jets' front line is obviously very good. I will say this Jets defense is fourth in running back receptions allowed, which obviously Austin Eckler will benefit from. The team total for the Chargers is lower than it typically is, only at 22 and a quarter points because they are in New York this week. But I know it's been really up and down the season, I think mostly due to injury. He at least has in his four healthiest games 17 expected half PPR points. So he's a locked in. Uh, top five running back. I think mean, there's right. a chance that he could finish as the RB1 overall this week. I, I was about to say the exact same thing. There aren't many players on this list that, in my mind, have an avenue of finishing the week as running back one overall. Without the bye weeks, Austin Eckler, and even without them, always has a chance of finishing mm-hmm. as the running back one overall. Okay, Raheem Mostert. Let's go back to the well, Hayden. Uh, this is in Germany, 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning. For you, 6.30 a.m. You're not going to get up and watch this against the Kansas City Chiefs. I will say... The Chiefs have allowed 120 and 118 rushing yards to the Chargers and Broncos backfields over the last two weeks after keeping every other backfield below 100 yards since the season opener. To me, that outlines a real bounce back spot for Raheem Mostert uh, just from a pure yardage perspective. You call it bounce back spot. I call it eruption spot for the Dolphins on the ground. We always talk about the Chiefs defense is very good, and I still believe it is very good, but... For opposing running backs, they do actually move the ball on them. They're, the Chiefs have allowed the second most EPA per carry, 4.6 yards per carry to running backs. Typically, teams just can't uh, get positive game scripts, so those running backs get out of the picture. Well, obviously, with the Dolphins, we don't have to worry about that as as often. So uh, it's not been like the sexiest games recently for Raheem Moster, but as, as a reminder, three weeks ago, he was finishing as like the RB1 overall. So just because he's had two somewhat down weeks, 
where he's only av- only averaging 16.3 half PPR points without a chance in the lineup. Uh, do not forget what Raheem is capable of doing. Well, hopefully he gets full practices in. He's been on the injury report a little bit recently. Yeah, and maybe that was part of why he only handled 48% of Miami's backfield touches. That's been his lowest rate since week four. And just to put a, num- a few other numbers to this, uh, he has had fewer than 80 total yards now in four of his past five games, but still he has 12 touchdowns on the season. Those so, help. Those absolutely help. And Teron Armstead's back at practice. There we go. Big sirens. Josh Jacobs, you're running back five. This is against the New York Giants. The Giants have allowed just 85 rushing yards on 33 carries to the commander's backfields and the Jets' backfield in the last two weeks. But mind you, Brees Hall also scored a 50-yard touchdown uh, out of the backfield as well. Uh, Yeah, I think that we'll be fine with Josh Jacobs. Uh, He has 22% target share on 51 Aiden O'Connell dropbacks. And sometimes you'll just watch O'Connell and he immediately just goes, finds a check down. And obviously Josh Jacobs will benefit from that. I think eventually they might get Zamir White moving, but I think that they're going to actually try to get uh, Josh Jacobs comfortable with Aiden O'Connell, the rookie, very inexperienced player. Uh, And the Giants did just trade away Leonard Williams this week. Um, So that's obviously one of the better defensive tackles in the in the league. So uh, RB5 usage and last week, at least for one drive, Josh Jacobs looked really well. I think they're going to try to just make Jacobs, the focal point, De- Devontae Adams first read targets, and then Josh Jacobs catching d- dump offs. And I think in a week with a bunch of star running backs on by, I view Josh Jacobs as a top five option. Yeah, you and consensus rankings are pretty much aligned this week on many names. I think it's difficult not to be in a week like this, uh, but they do have him as running back eight. And again, he is your running back five. Did you look at how many targets he had in a Nocano's lone start this season? Yeah, it was like eight or nine. I remember it, it was just like it was 11. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, it's 22% targets on 51 dropbacks. So that to me, that's not shocking either, just knowing Aiden O'Connell's game. Totally. So I, I am worried about the Raiders long term and obviously in this game, but I'm not worried that they're going to get like Zamir White going in this contest. Maybe in week right. 17, 18, sure. But right now, they need to protect Aiden O'Connell. Okay. Brees Hall's up next. Brees Hall against this Los Angeles Chargers defense. Uh, What we are seeing from Brees Hall is the same electricity and the reason why I wanted to draft him. Um, I think many people thought like this would be the time for him to ramp up about halfway through the season and then boom, we can go from there. But he and Garrett Wilson are this entire offense and they are just trying to get to December and January for Aaron Rodgers to come back. And it feels like on a weekly basis right now, we are getting one big Brees Hall play and one big Brees Hall play equals a top 10 score in week. It, it has. And he has been the RB 11 in usage too. So it's not just the big plays. He is getting uh, fairly involved. I will say Chargers defense, we have picked uh, fun at them, but they are only allowing 3.6 yards per carry to opposing running back. So they have tightened up there and Brees Hall could be down to like his like third string center. They're obviously missing Elijah Vera Tucker. There's been lots of injuries for Brees Hall. He's made the most of it, but Zach Wilson's also coming off as uh, one of his worst games. So I like Brees Hall's chances of a long play, but everything literally is working against him, but he's so good. He's kind of like early career Saquon Barkley in some ways where he's getting all that volume that you're talking about, but you know he has that one play in him every single game to take it to the house and change his fantasy day. It just might happen the first quarter. It might happen in the third quarter. It might happen in the fourth quarter, but Mm -hmm. it's inevitable. Jonathan Taylor's next. We had a long discussion on Stats versus Film. Hopefully you all tune into that show, that program, uh, on the weirdness of him walking with a limp and only getting like one touch in like the final quarter of the game um you have confidence though against this carolina panthers defense having him as your running back seven pending injury reports we're recording wednesday before we get any of those uh assuming that he's getting in full practice this week i do like jonathan taylor's chances of uh having a big game first of all the colts offense is playing with a lot of pace we talked about that basically every single show this week because of matchups they're actually projected for top 10 points on the week. So I'm hoping that the Jonathan Taylor interesting usage last week was because he was slightly banged up. Hopefully he's ready to go by. I even have Zach Moss ranked inside my top 24 because this Colts offense has been really fun over the last um, month of the season or the last three games. Jonathan Taylor is up to the RB 12 in usage. So I like this spot for Jonathan Taylor to really pay off. Assuming he's healthy. We love Shane Sykin on the show because 
you're working with your second string quarterback in Gardner Minshew, yet this offense is still keeping four players that are starting caliber. Yeah. You know, Michael Pittman, Josh Downs, Jonathan Taylor, and Zach Moss. We'll get to Zach Moss in a little bit. The reason why he's getting so much work is because he's good he has this been season. Good. He's legit good this year. This is, I think, a chance for both running backs to potentially get home. The Panthers have allowed a league-high 14 touchdowns to running backs this season. Next they've up, been, Joe Mixon. Real quick, they've been, like, by themselves, the Panthers, on their EPA allowed on the ground, like, literally, no one's even close to them. It's that bad. Next up, Joe Mixon against the Buffalo Bills. Um, finally got home for the touchdown last week. Uh, it was a shotgun run, I believe, uh, but it was off tackle that he bounced. Again, the healthier that Joe Burrow gets, to me, there is just a trickle down in just the higher success rate that this offense is going to have in general. And to me, again, there's a trickle down to Joe Mixon's success too. Completely agree. Joe Burrow was phenomenal last week. And it's not a surprise that the Bengals have the second highest projected point total of the week playing Buffalo. We have shootout potential. Joe Mixon does get involved uh, in shootouts because he can catch passes. He obviously is going to be the goal line back. He hasn't been efficient on those, but like you said, getting some level of under center runs will help him long-term. And right now the bill's defense is fairly good, but they're also extremely injured and they've allowed 4.8 yards per carry to running backs. One of the highest marks in the entire league. So I believe I'm a higher on Joe Mixon. I'm hoping we can get into the end zone again, but more importantly, this was just me looking at Joe Burrow's game last week and not putting anything on the calf in injury anymore. Right. To me, this is like lights out Joe, uh, Joe Burrow MVP level play for the rest of the way. Let's have the B. John Robinson conversation because he's your number nine running back this week against the Minnesota Vikings. Um, are you adjusting your ranking at all now that we have Taylor Heineke confirmed as a starter? I'm not. I think they're so similar just based off of how good they are. I view both of them oh, as like... You mean the, the, the talent level, not how good yeah. they are. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah they're both uh, solid backups uh, in this league. Got it. Um, the Vikings are a very interesting defense. We talked about this as well because they have so many uh, defensive players like like threatening the the pass uh, right at the line of scrimmage that they usually like, flick the ball out to wide receiver screen. So the, the Vikings, even though they haven't been very good on defense, they're actually seventh best against fantasy running backs. But at this point, I'm just like looking for big plays. And I do think that B. John Robinson still has the opportunity to do that. He still is not getting the goal line carries, but at least B. John did score a touchdown from, I believe it was about seven yards out. So not a great spot, but with other RB1s on by, he sneaks into the top 10. He has gone over 80 total yards in just one of his past six games played this season. He also had zero catches last week, which is very different than the dialogue that Arthur Smith and company had after they drafted him uh, when we were going to get the pony personnel stuff, which again is always better in the summer and on paper than it is in practice. I will add though, Hayden, it's not just the Falcons that have, you know, a quarterback change this week. It's also the Minnesota Vikings. They are going with Jaron Hall here. So don't we think that the Falcons should have the ball more and potentially in more advantageous situations inside the opposition's half way more often. Yeah, I, th I think that's totally fair. But Bijan, when they are chasing points, like that's not necessarily such a bad thing for him either. Um, I guess maybe the one thing, the difference is Ritter was more of a check, take your check down type of guy where Heineke loves to sling that ball around. So maybe there's some downside uh, with his targets. But I think that Bijan, I would be surprised if, if Arthur Smith's benching his quarterback, I wouldn't, I'd be pretty surprised if he doesn't really get this ground game trying to go. Yeah. I mean, this might be a ridiculous statement and I am not, I wasn't as hyped up about Bijan heading into the season as other people were. And we kind of discussed it on stats versus film. The reasoning why is because now he's, you know, on pace for about 251 touches versus the 350 that I think he needed to get to in order to be like that ridiculous legendary rookie running back opportunity. Um, but I think Bijan might have a pathway to like top two or three scoring this week. But that's trying to get in the brain of Arthur Smith a little yeah. bit. I think and it goes against, play. yeah, it, it goes against what you said about Washington's defense too, where, I mean, they are allowing just 3.54 yards per carry to backs because of all the bodies that they put in the gaps up front mm -hmm. and just 10 rushing points per game to backfield. So yeah, it would nice. It'd be nice to get uh Bijan a bit more involved in the passing game. One more player, Hayden, that I've had a, 
my brain a blender about this week is uh, DeAndre Swift against the Dallas Cowboys. I think you have him too low. I I am too low. Tell me, tell me why. No, so if you all didn't tune into our instant reaction show and stats versus film, I really have had my brain to blender about DeAndre Swift this you week. Have. I mean, I'm like talking to myself one way or another, and I think I figured it out. I stayed up last night just thinking about DeAndre Swift. My point is, actually, I'm impressed with how successful he has been this season without having really explosive runs. That's where I am right now. So rather than knocking him for the lack of explosive runs, I should say having him as the running back 12 to 14 or whatever it is on a weekly basis, we haven't seen, to me, this Eagles offensive line dominate in the last few weeks as we have previously expected and also leading to explosive runs that we know that they can have because he's being you know limited to five, six, seven, eight, nine yard chunks. So in a game where... I mean, both defensive lines and offensive lines on both sides is potentially stellar matchups. Um, DeAndre Swift is one of those outlets, I think, other than obviously A.J. Brown that could have a big day. Dallas is only allowed 3.6 yards per carry, but DeAndre Swift is like basically averaging 3.6 yards before contact as well. So the to me, the rushing lanes have been there. He has been not that good to me on tape either. Does get tripped up quite a lot, but... You do have to trust this Eagles team. The Eagles team total is down where they typically are. But like you said, in like the six or seven games he's been with Kenny Gainwell as like the starter, he's averaging 16 expected half PPR points. So he's definitely an RB1 to me. Let's keep it going and we'll go over to the next tier. And that means that Isaiah Pacheco is up next. This is once again in Germany against the Miami Dolphins. Um, Isaiah Pacheco has now had more than 64 yards in just one of his past four games. And Hayden, that is despite owning 70% of the backfield touches in five straight games. The, it was a season low for Isaiah Pacheco last week in usage because they lost and it was like a very decisive loss. This game should be closer and the chiefs as usual have the highest team total of the week here. So I'm just expecting things to, to normalize, even though he doesn't get all the yards. Always. He does have some of the highest touchdown odds uh, of the week. So this is just hoping that he gets a touchdown in this format, because the next couple names are also hit and miss when it comes to catching passes or having a bunch of yardage as well. But those teams are not projected to score 26 points this week. I was searching for this during our DeAndre Swift conversation. As you can see, his yards before contact is at about 2.4 yards is from Chris Wecht on tr on Twitter. And Isaiah Pacheco is kind of like right here on the average of mm -hmm. everything. So it's interesting to see a bunch of these names um, pop up and like where they deliver in terms of creating yards on their own versus the yards created for them. Next up, that is Tony Pollard against the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, the opposite end of this, Hayden, the opportunity would dictate that Tony Pollard should be higher on this ranking. But as we have discussed, the explosiveness has been a bit sapped from Tony Pollard so far this season. Right. He's the RB 18 on RB seven usage Ooh. this season. Ooh. That's really bad. It's like it's like almost it's it's shocking uh, completely. He's only had one game. Uh, Next Gen Sets every single week has the top 20 ball carriers when it comes to just miles per hour he's only hit that uh unit once on the entire season he Man, was doing that every like, single week i feel like everyone or every single one of his explosive plays last year hit 21 yeah. miles per hour at least he's done a, he's reached 20 miles an hour just once with the ball in his wow. hands this season so and it was that play where he got slingshotted uh after catching that ball and and over the middle of the field and obviously when you're going against the eagles defense things get much tougher to me it's been a new system using a lot more gap runs a lot more north style rushing which we can debate if that necessarily fits Tony Pollard's uh, playing style. The offensive line has been beat up, but I think at some point you just have to say, prove it to me a little bit here. So I'm kind of middling the production with the usage and the Cowboys offense looked pretty damn good last week with Dak Prescott. Obviously just a terrible matchup going against yeah. the aliens on the Eagles defensive line. Your running back 13 is Gus Edwards against yeah, right. the Seattle Seahawks. Over the past three weeks, Gus Edwards has owned 53 backfield touches compared to Justice Hill's 24. We just talked about the Philadelphia Eagles defense, the Dallas Cowboys defense. I mean, the Seahawks are actually allowing a league low 3.13 yards per carry to opposing running backs. So the consensus rankings running back 17, 
you have him as a running back 13, and we do it all over again. And that defense did just add Leonard Williams, who is expected to play as well. So matchup wise, like if you're looking at like the per play basis, not that great. But Gus Edwards should have positive game script. The Ravens are six point favorites. They have a 24.5 team total. That's top five on the week. Over the last three games, he's averaging 15 expected half PPR points because he's getting all those goal line carries. To me, he looks good. The offense uh, in general for Baltimore the last couple of weeks has looked rock solid. So we'll get to the next names on this list. And to me, they're extremely similar, except Gus's team I know is very good. The next teams I'm less sold on. I can't wait to watch this matchup too. By the way, uh, tomorrow morning, Thursday morning, uh, we'll have a new episode of Scheme with Colt McCoy focusing in on the Seattle Seahawks offense, which we'll get to in a moment with Kenneth Walker. But this is just a fun matchup to look at on paper. And Hayden, what makes it even more fun is we're doing a giveaway. These are the Underdog Football Show hats, one of a kind. You can't get them anywhere else. We're going to give five away right now because every single week, Hayden ranks Gus Edwards higher than consensus <laughs> rankings. And most weeks, he is correct. So we want you to be right with him in the comments. You need to leave your guess, your estimate on how many half-point PPR points you believe that Gus Edwards is going to score this week, plus your underdog fantasy username. And that's it. So make sure you're on the app. We'll match your deposit up to $100. Use promo code the show if you're not on underdog fantasy. But yeah, half PPR points, Gus Edwards. I'm going to go with about 29. Well, don't give away your answer. 29.8 half PBR points for the goal of Gus Bus. Yeah, why not? And again, we'll pick five of those, and we'll do five more on the uh, wide receiver show here on Friday as well. Producer Weaves just mentions to us that Raheem Mostert was DNP, but it's early in the week. It's early in the week. Kenneth Walker in the same game is your running back 14. Again, the opposite end of this at the Baltimore Ravens. He has scored a touchdown in all but three games this season. And while we love to discuss how good this Ravens defense is, Hayden, they are allowing a run of 10 or more yards now on 12% of opponent rushes, which is 23rd in the league. And we need, you know, one of those 10 plus yard runs for Kenneth Walker to go for 40 plus. I'm hoping Kenneth Walker is not on the injury report like he was last week. Maybe that plays into why Kenneth or uh, Kenneth Walker was losing snaps to Zach Charbonnet. I will say a lot of the snaps were just on passing situations the two minute drill later in the game, Charbonnet uh, earned some looks, but the difference between like Kenneth Walker and Gus bus right now is just the team totals. Uh, right now, the Seahawks are projected for like one of their fewest points of the season this week. You can look at this chart right here, which is just projected points and then plays per game. The Seahawks are in a tier that you, we usually don't see this offense in obviously facing Baltimore. will do that. So a little bit more of a committee approach because this is the post by rookie bump era for Mr. Charbonnet, who does look pretty solid to me. So I have Kenneth Walker at the lowest probably in my rankings this entire season. I hate that, but I do think that's the reasonable take to have right now. You know, I, I don't think anyone's going to be reasonable in their observations in this game of the usage between Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet as well. Because, like, if we see Zach Charbonnet in there in the second drive of the game, then everyone's going to be like, it's a split backfield. If we see Kenneth Walker go back to 80% or 70%, then it's going to side back in that direction. There's many different other permutations that can happen from there too. I just think both are really good, and they offer a bit of a different style there. And if you, again, watch Stats versus Film, we listen to Pete Carroll for a minute and a half, just outline how uh, both can be utilized in a backfield. And I just still love Kenneth Walker as a football player. He was even good last week on unlimited touches. Yep. Uh, I just really wish the, the freaking Seahawks didn't draft Charbonnet. Imagine Charbonnet with his own backfield, Kenneth Walker with his own backfield. Things would be much, much yeah, easier. Yeah, but what about in the NFC Championship when they both rush for a touchdown, you know, and we get they're, them in the Super Bowl? They're my team right now. I like them. Derrick Henry is your running back 15 at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Will Levis at quarterback. Tennessee games are averaging a league low 121 combined plays per game. Um, do we think that sustains itself with Will Levis at quarterback? Uh, I do. Just peeking back, uh, the obviously the offense was getting home because all those deep passes, but they were 31st in success rate uh, last week on the Will Levis dropbacks, only at 29%. And you're looking at the implied points this week, and the Titans just like literally could not stay out of this, quote, terrible quadrant just because they don't run any plays. They're, the betting markets aren't big fans of Will Levis on short rest this week as well. So 
Derrick Henry still getting a bunch of the work he got. Like he was playing to like 60% of the snaps, uh, even though they're coming off the bye, they did not trade him. I do think that they want to actually use Derrick Henry, but his touchdown odds are just diminished right now versus where they were previously. And I'm not sure that Will Levis is going to check down the ball to Derrick Henry. Not that he like, catches that many passes anyways. It's the lowest explosive rushing rate of Derrick Henry's career at just 7.5%. Cam Hayward, I believe, is back Yes, for this game. I am a little bit nervous about these Tennessee offensive linemen, specifically the two tackles yeah. against TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith. And now you throw Cam Hayward in the mix in the interior. I mean, look, Derrick Henry does have 95 yards at least in four of his last six games hitting 100 yards in three of his past four. But um, I think this is one of those matchups where, hey, now that the stalwart in the middle is back, this yeah. Steelers defensive line could look a bit different against, I would say, a Titans offensive line that is maybe, what, bottom five, bottom seven across the league? Generously, yes. Generously. Ramondre Stevenson is your running back. 16th is against the Washington Commanders. So the commanders have been pretty bad on defense already, and they just lost, obviously, Chase Young and Montez Sweat at the trade deadline. The Patriots are now projected for the 11th most points on the week at home. Right now, Mac Jones will be throwing to Pop Douglas and Jalen Rager as right. his top running backs. Ramondre Stevenson is more than capable of being a check down option. Get him in the screen game. Get his yards after contact up because he's like basically dead last in that category this year. But... Last week, it did seem like he had a little bit more jump to his game. He handled a lot more of the opportunities last week than he did previously, like you can see in this chart right here. A lot less Zeke Elliott throughout the game. You do get Ramondre at the goal line. So things have been going a little bit up if you really squint with the Ramondre Stevenson stuff. In fact, the last three games, 15, 13, and 12 expected half PPR points. So this is about as good of a game script as Ramondre Stevenson can, could have against a defense at like by all definitions is very much tanking. Yeah. It wasn't like 10 carries for 31 yards or something. And I legit thought that Ramondre right. Stevenson looked his best running the football of the season. Um, I will add this Washington commanders defense is allowing 4.6 receptions per game to opposing running backs. So maybe we get a bit more involved, like you said, in that area, Chuba Hubbard, you're running back 17 against the Indianapolis Colts. Did it work? Not really, but Chuba <laughs> did have the start, the goal line opportunities, and finish the game off, and the two-minute situation as well. Uh, right now, the Colts are averaging a very nice 69 plays per game on defense. That's the most in the NFL, and Carolina right now is up to 21 projected points, which is among the highest that they've been the entire season. So I think that this is not a for-sure Chuba Hubbard game of 70% touches, but I think that's the most likely outcome. And right now you have to take his expected points at 15.4 of them. I will say we will be chasing these expected points. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll actually get uh, the volume that this offense is technically creating because everything still seems a little, little out of scene. We were praising this offense last yeah. week because they did look functional. They did score 15 points against the Texans. So. Yeah. And wide receivers were still slow. Chuba Hubbard missed a couple pass pro reps, to yep. be honest with you. Uh, right guard, Austin Corbett being back did help, but then you still have Calvin Throckmorton starting at left guard, and Ike Aquanu has uh, regressed mightily. What uh, happened there with Ike? Um, I think maybe he the expectation was a bit too high entering the season. Didn't play as well as people thought during his rookie year, but now his he just has lead in his feet. It looks like right now just has lead in his feet, but wait, that's shocking because he like is like a good athlete. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, very weird. I don't know. I'm I am no offensive line expert other than to say that when you wind up on the floor and uh, <laughs> giving up like two yards of separation to opposing pass rushers, yeah, it's not a good thing. Yeah, you know when you're you know what when it looks bad, right? Aaron Jones, um, they the Packers against the Los Angeles Rams. We haven't gotten any indication that Aaron Jones is like back to 100% full health or 100% full usage. Yeah, he said he said he was feeling better, but then the results were 51% snaps, lost both the goal line reps to AJ Dillon last week, only had 11.6 expected half PPR points. So I need to see full practices. And even then, do you trust this Packers offense? I'm not sure I do. And I think with this season more or less completely dusted at this yeah. point, they were sellers at the trade deadline with Razul Douglas. 
I'm not sure if like we're they're like hoping to get Aaron Jones 20 touches the rest of the year. I feel like they're they're slow playing this thing because he's an older back that's come off of multiple setbacks with a lingering hamstring injury. So this is just hoping that he's healthy and that he can take off because we've seen it before, but it's not the my favorite Aaron Jones spot either. Yeah, didn't he have to take like a big cap restructure this offseason to stick yes. with this team? Yeah, I mean, he just has basically void years the rest of the way. Right. That's rough. Um, and to your point about this team slow playing it, they have scored a touchdown on just two of 38 drives in the first half of the season. 5.3% of their drives have ended in touchdowns in the first half. So that is starting slow. Uh, running back 19 is Rashad White. He is facing the Houston Texans. He has now not rushed for 40 yards in the game since week four and has hit 40 yards on the ground just twice this season. We've seen the Buccaneers just abandon the run, which, I mean, it was long overdue. Right now, the Bucs are sixth in neutral pass rate. This month, all the way up to 61% of their uh, early down situations, they're passing the ball. Rashad White has been the beneficiary of that in the last two games, caught seven and six passes. But those were both losses, and one of them against the Bills, he was at the last couple drive just catching a bunch of passes. I'm not sure how sticky that is in a game that's supposed to be much closer, uh, and we just don't see any of the rushing production from him. So he gets there because he's on the field, but am I excited to start Rashad White? Not really. Yeah, I mean, he has to keep that receiving work. Uh, he had 16 catches in the opening five games of the season. In the last two weeks, he's had 13 catches. So right. is this like a change that they've made? Maybe because the running game isn't working. Or is this just like a weird two-week span? And the answer is kind of somewhere in between when he was getting very little receiving work. Well, on that Bills game where they had the Chris Godwin almost Hail Mary, like the last two drives, it was just like prevent, and he caught like three, three or four passes on that one. So I'm not sure how sticky this is. Kareem Hunt opens your tier four as the running back 20. Uh, we talked about it. This is against the Arizona Cardinals and how the split in the backfield is right now because obviously Jerome Ford isn't too far behind him, but right now Kareem Hunt is the red zone hammer. That's been the difference. This is short yardage rushing success. Kareem, number one in the league, 85% of his uh, carries with three yards or fewer to go. Jerome Ford, dead last in that category. So that's been the difference in their usage. Both will play a ton. Both of them will get enough opportunities to pay off as borderline RB2 options. I think Kareem Hunt has the better opportunity for a touchdown. And speaking of touchdowns, I don't know what's gotten into uh, the Browns offense, but they are projected oh, for a well, touchdown. playing. Yeah, it's, maybe maybe he's playing. I'm, I'm he assuming is. he is. He's okay. practicing right now. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that will that will help out their team total. They're somehow I don't know how this is this is the case. I think Vegas knows he's playing. But they, well, how have they played the most offensive plays per game this season? Like when I don't remember any of those. Yeah. No, it's it's very fair. Uh, PJ Walker is one of those quarterbacks who uh, will just rip it. You know, like yeah. he will let it loose and he'll be aggressive. And I think there is something to say about that rather than you know, being a backup quarterback and not, you know, wanting to make a mistake and, and and playing with fear. Next up for you, it is Zach Moss. Yes, two Colts running backs in the top 21. Uh, this was the shocking statistic that I found in Retrieve Bar's worksheet ahead of week, week nine. Zach Moss is now second in the NFL with 294 rushing yards on explosive runs this year, which are 10 plus yards, only behind Chris McCaffrey. So on paper, Zach Moss is the second most explosive running back in the NFL this season. Well, we, luckily it's not running the football. On paper, I should right, say for running sure. the football. He was down to like 35% of the snaps last week. So we'll see if that is sticky. That's kind of like the range. I was thinking that this backfield would settle 65, 35, but this is an opportunity. Like we said, the Colts seventh highest team total of the week. So in positive game script here, we could see Zach Moss who split the goal line reps before Jonathan Taylor kind of had that setback, if you will. This will ultimately decide if, or will, this ranking will ultimately be decided on if Jonathan Taylor is like true, truly healthy or not. But this is assuming that Jonathan Taylor is healthy and he's still the RB21. He's had at least 10 expected half PPR points in each of the last three games. James Cook at the Cincinnati Bengals is up next. Uh, we have Leonard Fournette on the practice field. A lot of Leonard Fournette practice videos from beat writers as well i, I actually and that's if, why if that was on your radar this morning it was um what we've talked about james cook too is that his receiving usage has just fallen off a cliff in recent weeks as well and if 
the Bills continue this low time to throw, get the ball out of, out of Josh Allen's hands quickly, then that's also going to hurt James Cook's chances as well. Yeah, there's a lot of reps. I shouldn't say a lot. There's some reps where the running backs are just like in empty, just like by themselves on the sideline. John, or Josh Allen's not going to be throwing the ball to James Cook out there. So yeah, the, just the offensive tinkering has worked against James Cook. And I think that Leonard Fournette is going to play this week. And I actually do think he's going to play a decent amount here. So this will go from two running backs down to three running backs. We don't love that. And the bills just because they're playing in Cincinnati have a 23 point team total. Typically the bills are like 26 to 30, depending on the matchups. There's a little bit less of a pie to soak up. So yeah, it's just been really bad for James cook recently. Now we get Jerome Ford as the running back 24. I will call him the primary runner on this team. Whereas I think he's going to start. I think he'll probably get the most touches, but he is a big play runner more so than a short yardage runner. If he gets in full practices this week and there's any inclination that they're going to remove Pierre Strong from this this rotation, I will be moving Jerome Ford up, especially if we get Deshaun Watson healthy. Because I do agree with you. He's the best, the most explosive rusher. Yeah. He's not as thick as Kareem Hunt is right now. But the, to me, there's no reason that Pierre Strong should be playing. It should be these two guys. Last week, it wasn't the case. Obviously, Ford was barely able to play, but did finish the game strong. And receiver. Um, I think he is an underrated receiver, underappreciated receiver by the general public out there too. Brian Robinson is up next. I mean, the tale of two halves of the season so far in the first half of the season. Um, Brian Robinson, his fourth straight game with 12 or fewer opportunities and fifth time over the past six weeks, whereas the opening segment of this season, um, he was dominating backfield touches, dominating touches in general. He basically has to score a touchdown right now to be relevant. Yeah, in my notes, I have this is the touchdown prayer range. If if these guys aren't scoring touchdowns, you're you're walking with four or five fantasy points. So maybe he does it against the Patriots. He hasn't had 10 expected half fever points since week four, like you mentioned. And that's because the commanders right now are third in neutral pass rate this month. They've just stopped giving B Rob the rock. There's been games where Chris Rodriguez has popped in there to make this a three back committee. And with Washington's defense being sellers at the trade deadline, that's going to even make it harder for Brian Robinson to get positive game scripts. So, and he has still, to have, yeah, he has to have it or get a goal line opportunity. Right. That's what I'm betting on here, I guess. Commanders are selling. You need to sell B Rob. Like, see what you can get for him right now. We've already seen the best part of his season, in my opinion. So, like, I would trade him straight up for Jerome Ford the rest of the way. Easy. For sure. For sure. Easy. See what you can do for him. Next up, Damian Pierce. Um, we had a touchdown last week. We had a touchdown last week. <laughs> then we didn't. Uh, and then we had an Andrew Beck rushing touchdown. Then we had a CJ Stroud rushing touchdown. This is the same situation as Brian Robinson. It's a definitely a committee backfield. At least Damon gets the rock at the goal line when Andrew Beck allows it. We will see if that is the case. But at least the Texans offense to me is always somewhat watchable. They do need to stop running the ball as much. I think that would actually get Damian Pierce to the goal line more often because they have been so ineffective rushing between the tackles right now. So he's the RB28 in usage. I'm RB25 in my rankings with some teams on buys. Hopefully he actually scores a touchdown. I'm just not banking on it. Yeah, I've seen some places where Devin Singletary is ranked above him. Your oh, note that Damian Pierce did play all five snaps inside the five-yard line compared to Devin Singletary, you know? Yeah, that's a too cute putting Devin Singletary above. Come. I mean, that, 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 and that's a pretty significant difference between the right. two. Okay, Najee Harris is even after Damian Pierce, and I think for a good reason. Uh, he has, though, reached 60% of the backfield opportunities in just two of seven games so far. And lately, in his last 35 carries, that has equal just 103 yards. Not great. RB32 usage this month. The Steelers playing against the pass funnel Titans. Only thing you can kind of drum up is sometimes the Titans offense is so bad that teams can just run the ball out in the later part of the games against them. So maybe we get that with Najee. He still is the goal line back. So it's the same situation as B-Rob and Damian Pierce. Committee members on iffy teams, not creating explosive plays. Who's scoring a touchdown? I don't know. You tell me. The graveyard continues with Alexander Madison. Uh, he did have 17 touches last week compared to Cam Akers' 10. But as we talked about, Jaron Hall 
is now at quarterback. We already know that Alexander Madison has not been an efficient player inside of the 10 yard line this year. Yeah. And it would be very difficult for the Vikings to get inside the 10 yard line as frequently as they were previously. Second fewest projected points as a team this week. So really tough spot for Alexander Madison. They they were rotating drives early in the game. Then they went hot hand approach with Alexander Madison. But that still does scare me that like if Cam Akers has a good run early in the first half, then like all those stats where you get 17 touches are out the window. So this is a rug pull situation waiting to happen with Jaron Hall. And Atlanta has not allowed a rushing touchdown to a running back so far this season. They did just lose Grady Jarrett though. Um, some teams and some coaches in this situation, when they lose Kirk cousins might again, turtle up and just try to run the football. I don't think that's Kevin O'Connell's MO. Like, I don't think that that's his brain. I think he's going to continue to try to throw the football and not just now build the offense around Alexander Madison and Cam Akers. Bubble screens, tunnel screens, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkins, and check downs. We're going to get a whole bunch of that stuff, I think. And hopefully by a week or two, we also get, you know, Joshua Dobbs at quarterback, which again, stabilize it a little bit, but not to the level that Kirk Cousins was playing at, obviously. One more in this tier, and that is Daryl Henderson, uh, another totally split backfield. And now... One that probably doesn't have Matthew Stafford this week. No, I'm not expecting it. So the backfield was split. Daryl Henderson's the more trusted back on passing situations. The Green Bay defense has been really bad on the ground as usual. Royce Freeman got the goal in opportunity last week, but I would rather just catch some check downs in this kind of matchup than try to bank on a, a rushing touchdown. And at least Hendo got the goal in opportunity two weeks ago. So right. Very tough spot here. I do wonder if it is a backup quarterback and Matthew Stafford skips out this game, if Henderson catches three or four screens. And at this point on this bye weeks with these quarterbacks playing on the week, you will take your three or four receptions and walk out of there with your seven points, whether you like it or not. And we don't know how long Kyron Williams injury is, but is this going to be the third game that he's on the sideline? Then they have a bye yeah. and then it's one more game after that. Yeah, I think Williams we're a couple weeks out. So, but maybe Stafford's thumb heals yeah. at the same time Kyron comes back. Hendo looks slow. He oh, looks yeah. Slow. Of course. Of course. Let's get some Miles Gaskin out there. I'm serious. Let's get some Miles Gaskin out there. He Why at least not? has some juice in comparison to these guys. You know? Why not? Shock the world, Sean McVay. Shock the world. We'll finish this out just with the 29 plus crowd. That is Imari DiMarcado, who two weeks ago, Everyone expected him to get huge usage. He didn't. Then he did the last two weeks. Um, on top of that, it is Royce Freeman, then AJ Dillon, then Jalen Warren, and then Deontay Foreman. Talk to me. Do you see any upside with any of them? No. no. Um, I mean, the player with the best chance of breaking a long play is Jalen Warren, obviously. Um, Deontay Foreman against the Saints defense. They did give up 161 rush, rushing yards to the Colts' backfield last weekend, but before that, they had not allowed a running back to rush for more than 63 yards in a game. And we know Deontay Foreman, over the last two seasons, is like the most game script dependent back in the league. That and last week, it was a full blown rotation wow. even in the first half. Like you got Roshan drives, Deontay drives. I will say that's already game. down at 15% or like right. 0% in game winning percentage. So like the game was already over. For sure. Uh, but Darrington Evans also finishes the game. He gets a goal line opportunity late in the game. And it wasn't like that. Deontay Foreman wasn't not playing. Like he was all playing up until the fourth quarter. It's just a really bad situation. At least with Amari DiMercado, he was getting like all the opportunity early in the game. So I think I would go that way. And he has been but it's like against the Cleveland Browns. And you yeah. also already get bad quarterback play on top of it. Right. But I do think Amari could catch some dump off passes from Clayton Toon in ways that Deontay Foreman is not going to get there. So. Yeah, it's a tough situation. I, I I am with you. Jalen Warren is probably the best player of this grouping right here. Um, if you want to fire him up on Thursday night, but this is a really tough, tough range. Yes. Good luck to you. Good luck to you. And if you missed anyone, um, I can't believe you're considering playing them. Okay. That does Maybe it. Zach Zach Charbonnet. Maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You get him in I'm here. I'm surprised you didn't put Zach Charbonnet in there ahead of a few of those names. It's just Baltimore, you know. That's tough. Hold yeah. Charbonnet, though, and trade for oh, him, Oh, of too. course. Of course. Um, and then, like, if Mostert misses, then we get a 
weird dynamic of Salvin Ahmed and Jeff Wilson on top of yeah. that too. So yeah, we have line. a couple. This is one of those weeks when maybe like a random name pops up. I would trade Brian Robinson for Zach Charbonnet. You're not winning your league because of Brian Robinson. You could with Zach Charbonnet. So that's like an option to to make a trade. So basically, you want me to put Zach Charbonnet up here? That's what you're saying. Take a shot. I I truly hope that someone just get to the end of the video. Oh, of course. Just to see the end of the rankings. And they're like, what the hell is Zach Charbonnet up there? So we're yeah. going to get at least one of those comments, and I'm going to love it. There it is. There's Hayden's top 35 running back rankings. Okay. Go win a hat from me. Yeah. Again, the hat. Gus Edwards, your prediction. Half point PPR points. Leave it in the comment down below along with your underdog fantasy username. And we'll find the five closest and send you hats. Bang. Bang. You can be a Brooklyn dad just like us. All right. For Producer Waves, for Hayden, we'll be back tomorrow. Up the villa. Talk to y'all soon. See ya.